Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, theater, and entertainment. And I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the team behind Hulu's show, The Great. We have Tony McNamara, who's the creator, writer, and executive producer. Elle Fanning, who plays Catherine and is an executive producer on the show as well. And Nicholas Holt, who plays Peter. And Tony, I wanted to start with you in terms of the language. And I know that everyone always gloms on to the way that you really create this myriad of language between classical language and modern language and so much of writing is is thinking about various structure points particularly within episodic but within writing individual sentences with the way that you mix language I was really curious if there's a if there's some sort of structure that you've developed for yourself in the way that you merge these two language forms together um I yeah I figured I figure there is that just exists in my head probably without thinking about it I don't really like think about it too consciously I think originally I kind of did, I, I, not that consciously, but I was trying to create a language that was period, but very accessible and kind of modern. So probably at the start, I was a bit conscious of how I put it together, um, but now it's very second nature. So I, I never even think about it now. It's just a weird algorithm in my head or something. And then Elle, you know, you've talked extensively about jumping into television, how one of the things is the difference in pacing from movies and the way that scripts come at you at the last minute as they're still being written when you're working on it. But I was really interested in, in how that impacts you in terms of the dialect on the show. I know that you worked with a dialect coach throughout the first season. So when you're getting these scripts at the last minute, is there a difference in the way that you're having to work with scenes because you're also thinking very specifically about the sounds of the language and, and within the cadence? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Sandra Freeze is my dialect coach, um, and I've had I've done an English accent before, and she's always helped me on previous um, previous movies. I think like Tony's writing for this show, at least like so lends itself to just the English accent. Like if it, it just should totally, it just needs to be said in that way in that rhythm. I think so. It, I, I think having the accent actually helps me get into that tone and also memorize the words better because it just flows um, easier. I think like, I, I can't, I've never tried to do any other accent. Like that's the one accent I can do. So I'm like, okay, at least I'm kind of <laughs> okay at it and, and used to it. But um, yeah, you know, we, I work with, with her like once a week and we'll like get the scripts. We're like, okay, we're going to go over week per week and just like get it in my mouth and do funny you know, exercises, but we, you know, filming in London, we filmed the show in a studio in London. So it's helpful to be surrounded by a crew that's all speaking in that rhythm, you know, <laughs> um, a bit. So yeah, I think for, for now I've gotten used to it. And then Nick, I love how you've talked in the past about how, you know, despite all of your extensive experience that you always find yourself still asking a lot of questions about how certain things are working. And, and then in recent years, you've become really interested in post-production and editing and, and ultimately kind of like how your performance impacts some of the choices that are made at that stage. So I wanted to ask about in working on this show in particular, if that's one of the things that you've been looking at a little bit more in terms of post-production and, and if so, whether learning a little bit more about that process has impacted the way that you think about your performance on set at all. Um, yeah, I, I, one of our great DPs on the first series, John Brawley, gave me a book, actually. Um, I think it's called Blink of an Eye, which is a really good read and an insight into editing and stuff. And, and Ellen, Ellen and I were talking about it um, like a week or so ago as well, because I think particularly when, you know, with shows like this, you have different directors coming in. So sometimes in scenes, it's useful for you to have more of an awareness, you know, not overly complicating it in your mind because you doing the acting first and foremost but have more of an awareness of how things are going to come together um it makes it useful for you slightly on set in terms of watching how scenes play out and and what you're doing um particularly like we were saying kind of earlier there's kind of a slightly faster pace we're set in shooting wise um so yeah so it's useful to kind of think like that a little bit and i guess that's just me as well um getting older and trying to understand the game a little bit more yeah and because you were just mentioning the the different directors coming in on the series, and I know that Elle, you've talked about, you know, the adaptability of working with different directors um, in film even, and how you really take your working style, but also look to what's their stylistic approach. And, and so for the two of you, I was actually really curious about 
the way in which you adapt to a director's style, but on television at the same time, there's also this dance where they're adapting to your style because they're really looking at the ecosystem that's already in flow on set in terms of production and, and character approach, especially if they're coming in in later episodes and, and on the second season that you guys are filming right now. I think that's been um, one of the not biggest challenges, but just, I guess, one of the biggest standout differences between like film and television, because film, you're just, I mean, you're so relying. It's like that one director and that one person's vision. And then now we, we each block, you know, they pretty much our directors do about two, two episodes or maybe sometimes they'll come back later um, and, and we'll, they'll shoot some more episodes, but right when you get used to the flow, it's like they're taken away from you <laughs> and then someone else comes in. Um, but I think, and, and Nick and I talk about this a lot, there is something to the new person coming in. Like there is something there that like, you kind of need the shake up. I think like right when you get in the groove, it's like, all right, we're going to throw this at you. And you're like, oh, wow. Like they have obviously their own point of view and they're trying to adapt to us. And we have a very, you know, we have a specific thing with our show, but I think it's actually good that we have new, like a, just a, a new voice coming in that's like making you think about something from a different way. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's totally, it, it is interesting. <laughs> um, Cause I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I mean, it, it's, uh, yeah, it's just something to get used to. <laughs> And then Tony, one of the things I wanted to ask you about in terms of diving into writing season two is when you were working on the first season, you talked a little bit about how you'd have, I mean, you've got whiteboards behind you, but one of the things in the writer's room was these whiteboards that would have a lot of specific research details that you'd discovered about that point in time, you know, whether it was peeing on the wheat to see if you're pregnant and a lot of intrinsic in, intrinsic details like that but then as you were writing the scripts you would keep looking to those boards and seeing if there were places to pull those details in and in going into the second season is that still part of the process for you and something where you've created an extensive list of those sorts of things again yeah I mean we sort of created and then I think this year we 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 had it and it informed how we um thought about the season but um we we haven't we probably haven't looked at it as much as we did last year, maybe because it's the second season and we're, um, we're just a bit more in the groove. I mean, we, we kind of find things, even today we were like, find out, you know, we have an assistant who goes and does quick research for us. So uh, we did have a bunch at the start and then this year we're sort of doing it a bit more piecemeal as we, as we need things to kind of give texture or kind of an interesting way to think about something or what really happened. We sometimes do that. So um, yeah, it's a sort of random approach, but it seems to work. And I think it's so interesting that part of your writing process has always been writing things down on, on yellow legal pads. And how does the process of just physically writing it down on a pad really make it indelible in a different way or make you think about the text through going through the physical act of putting it on paper in that, in that way? I don't know, other than reminding me I'm old. And when I started, that's all we <laughs> yellow pads and fountain pens. I think I'm always more right now. Totally. Um, I think for me, it helps uh, free me up creatively. If I have to, even though we, we write, you know, I like to watch the show as I write and react to what's happening. So we do kind of run pretty close to the edge. Um, it, it, it means I know what's going to happen, but I just want to, it, it's just creatively freeing in a way. I don't think about what I'm doing. I don't worry if it's good. If it's just me scribbling on yellow paper. How much pressure can that be? Whereas if I have to write it on um, a computer, I'm like, oh, I'm actually writing a script and 120 people are going to go into action and go and do things because I wrote something and spend money and stuff. So uh, if I do it on yellow pad, it's just like, it's just me, like I was a kid doing it. So that's what I try and keep. So that, so that it's just fun and joyful for me to do it, you know, before it gets to the serious bit, you know. <laughs> and then Nick, I wanted to talk about your character a little bit because, you know, Tony always credits 
how much heart you bring into him so that when we have all these reprehensible things that he's doing on screen, that we still kind of understand and sympathize and, and connect with this character and where it's coming from. And I feel like you do such a fantastic job at really bringing this fallibility and this, this actual sense of loneliness because none of his connections because of his position of power, but also because of the way that he treats people are really kind of built on, on human connection and emotion in the same way. Um, and all he wants is desperately to be loved. And so I was really interested in, in how you bring a lot of that, that fallibility and that almost like childlike desperation for love into even the most reprehensible things that he's doing. Um, uh, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the fun part of the character really. And it is, it is very much in the right, though. It's kind of, you're kind of like a little detective reading the scripts as you go along and there's like little comments about mum and obviously you meet like mummified mum and dad looking down on you and all these things. So then you kind of piece those together and then gradually as we receive more episodes through the first series, you kind of unpack more and more about kind of the traumatic version of his childhood that um, caused him to be a little bit like that and, and how the court works. I think that's the fun thing about the show and kind of the useful thing for me as well, I guess being part of the favourite, I got to watch Olivia Coleman play the queen and that and see kind of how that role was for her in terms of being kind of a not a political pawn but you know in, in amongst that setting and how how lonely and isolating it can be and how manipulative people can be around you so it's kind of having that insight beforehand but then um yeah reading the scripts and it's kind of beautiful how how it develops because you do kind of meet this character and he's very much a bit of a buffoon in, in, in many ways. Um, and then gradually throughout the series, the more scripts I'd get, it'd be, it'd be more and more fun to play because you kind of got to peel away that uh, more bravado side of his personality and, and kind of see the little boy kind of inside of it. Right, and, and with, with that idea of there being the little boy inside of him, it really feels like there's certain aspects of his personality that just haven't fully developed or matured and formed in him. You know, I'm thinking about one of the scenes in the first season where he's literally just throwing everything around in his room and his aunt standing there saying, oh, you know, he's always done this ever since he was a boy. So how do you really look at aspects of who he is as a character and think about what are the things that he won't necessarily have developed and matured that he's still holding on to from his childhood like that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I just kind of make it up a little bit and see what the script says, basically. And also, I'm not always the most mature person ever, so I think that probably pays into it a fair bit. <laughs> <laughs> and Elle, I wanted to talk about your work producing the show because, you know, in the first se in putting together the first season, you had the opportunity to really go around and be part of the pitch meetings and be there during the development process, during the casting. But now that you guys are filming season two, what's the evolution of your role as a producer been and some of the new aspects that you've ended up involved in? Yeah, and I think, I mean, the other producers on the show and, and Tony, like I, Tony is so present on set always and um and we have such a such a great relationship I think like our shorthand and like we're we're pretty much always on the same page with what a scene's about or like what it's like yeah like that's just, we're just like obviously you know so I think that we trust each other in that way like I think that Tony trusts me also on set to if I'm like oh, I don't know if you know, it is. I'm like, I don't know if that is our show, you know, like, and I will, I'm like, I, I feel like in the first season, like, Catherine was obviously finding her, her voice as in power. And I kind of was navigating that you know, myself and like learning to, to speak out. And I think I've become pretty like outspoken <laughs> of a person. Um, if I see something that I'm like, mm, maybe we could do better or maybe we could, you know, try this. Like, why not? Like, you know, throw it at the wall, see what sticks with things. So um, I think, yeah, I guess I'm making more outspoken decisions sometimes. Um, be like, we need this or we don't need that. Um, but it's been fun. I mean, it's like that whole process of pitching and stuff that was also kind of a getting to know each other, Tony and I, that we like, had a nice lunch, like in between our pitches, which were so weird. <laughs> we're like, this is so weird, but it was also kind of more of us like getting to know each other and start that bond, which is basically, that's the most crucial thing. You just really want to trust everyone that you're working with. So yeah, and put in obviously the cast. I mean, like our ensemble cast, like they're 
so they're such incredible actors and they are also just the best people so i think that that was something that we've all talked about of like when casting we're like yeah but we also want people that are so cool and fun and people we want to hang out with and they're like we all love each other so much it's like it's like you know to say you're like oh yeah yeah of course you do but we really do um and they're just so unique and care about their character so much and have so much to say and they bring so much to the table so that was that's something that was i think one of the most important things in the beginning of the whole process of everything so that's so great um, and Tony, because the word ensemble cast came up, I actually want to talk a little bit about the way in which you service the ensemble cast of characters so well. And, you know, I'm even thinking about that final scene in the first season with the coup, where it really is, you know, essentially you're writing and servicing and giving a lot of depth and layering to a dozen characters within those few scenes. And, and sometimes they're only on screen for a snapshot of a moment, but you have to give us so many elements of what's their motivation? What are they doing? Why are they doing it? What's their relationship to everybody around them? And you really move those scenes into a lot of different physical locations as well. So it's really curious, you know, in, in looking back at that scene, how you crafted it out in such a way while making sure that you were fully servicing that number of characters and bringing so much detail forward in all of them. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think in writing the show, one of the hard things is um, servicing everybody. Um, because I don't, I, it's sort of like how to make it really organic, but you have to keep the, the world of the court alive. And it's also, um, they are an incredible ensemble. So it is, you really do want to, and the fun of second season has been putting together characters who have never been in a room together or, because I think when you're writing it, which is in the casting, we just found these great actors who are so lovely um, and they always bring something great there's no one in there you it's sort of like whatever you want to write they can all do it which is great and then the other thing is it's just a balance issue really it's like it's all driven out of um alan nick's characters really every i'm always like that we're telling those stories and then it is about just kind of as skillfully as possible weaving everyone else into it with their own agendas with their own feelings about everything so that they're not just functional so they have their own so I guess that's the trick which does take a little bit of work but um I mean they're so great it's, it's sort of worth it and it's why I guess we've got an ensemble award because they are so great and we we were so lucky to find such great people and then Ellen, Nick, one of the scenes that I wanted to ask the two of you about within that within that moment is the scene where the two of them essentially have that really extensive two-hander because I think both of you bring so many different layers and nuances into that. There's a real power play going on between them. There's a lot of comedic elements and there's also real genuine emotion and heartbreak for both of them in very different ways. So by the time you got to the point of shooting that particular scene, how did the two of you really take those pages of, of dialogue and think about all of the different moments and, and kind of the emotional roller coaster and the different layers that these characters are going through in that particular scene. And these are the scenes at the end of episode 10? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, those were fun ones, weren't they? <laughs> sure. We were really looking forward to those, to that one. We were like, it was a build up. <laughs> like, ooh, here we go. Yeah, I mean, uh, how did we prepare? We were like, we, we did rehearse them a little bit physically in terms of planning out just where we we're going to be just to make sure that on the day we had enough time to shoot them. But also I think we both just have a lot of fun in scenes with each other. Um, I think we enjoy like bouncing off of each other and seeing where the scene goes. And also the, those scenes being the climax of everything as well, they, they, they flipped so nicely back and forth in terms of who had the power and who had the upper hand and what was going to happen. and um, that's just then a really fun thing to play, I think, in the scene of who's setting traps for the other one and, and how it plays out. Um, yeah, so I think those scenes are just enjoyable to play for me anyway, because we just kind of get to go go at each other um, in a really fun way. Yeah, I, th I think that the, yeah, the, that one, at least the, the power play of that, and then, and also the, the fact that like, she's found out she's pregnant. And so there's like, a baby in the mix and I remember and like it was that whole the, the the costume design of that of like having me like cut the stomach out that was like all Tony's idea of like in the script I'm like like all right 
how are we going to do this? They're like, I, it was a whole, like for that scene, it was a whole, like, I don't know, like construction. Like we're like, okay, like through the corset cut, like it was like this whole like mechanism that was going on. But um, I think it made for a very iconic um, image with, with the pink and um, yeah, the, I mean, Nick and I, I don't know, we have the best time, like, I mean, we work in a very like similar way and we're constantly trying to kind of challenge each other in the scenes. And um, yeah, I know it's, it's crazy. Like one scene can be wrapped up in so much like emotion and drama. And then also there are like jokes in it. So you're like, well, I have to kind of hit the punchline too while being truthful and actually feeling the weight of the world and the situation. Because I, I mean, when it comes down to it, the show is very grounded in like real trauma. <laughs> You know, like high stakes. <laughs> so. And then off the back of that, Tony and Elle, I wanted to talk about that very, very final scene in the show when Catherine's essentially running across the grounds after she's lost the love of her life. And there's no dialogue in that moment. And yet it tells you absolutely everything that you need to know on screen. And so I was interested in, in how the two of you figured out what the beats of that scene were gonna be. And, and if, if it was always that delivery and that singular performance or whether you tried different nuances of it at all when you were filming it. I, mean, I think because the show, I mean, it didn't need any dialogue, really. I mean, it was, yeah. I think for, I think the show's very dark. Like in my, I'm always like, di we, have, we have a lot of dialogue, <laughs> as, as these two know. Um, but it's very powerful when we suddenly don't. And, and we, you, you know, you let, like we did it recently as well in season two. It's like, it's just letting suddenly our great actors just have, take everything they've done and earned into those moments and have them, you know. So I think um, that was always the idea was what else could, there was literally nothing else to be said, you know. Yeah, we filmed that in yeah. Italy, in Caserta. Yeah. We got to do that in the first season. Yeah, this beautiful castle. <laughs> like, oh, we want to go back. <laughs> we miss We're homesick for Italy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ella Nick, you know, because the two of you talk so so much about how you work very similarly and, and there's a really instinctual style to both, both the way that you both approach a lot of scenes in your craft. Um, I was really curious what that looks like when the two of you are coming together and, and rehearsing scenes beforehand or, or particularly when you're going into a scene with a little bit less time to talk about it and have rehearsals and how you really just kind of work and balance off of each other and reading each other's performances to find what those beats are going to be together. I take that one up. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we had a scene. We've been having like this whole week. We've had a lot of like a lot of scenes together. Like they kind of crammed them in. So we've been doing um, a lot of those like two handers. Some really like great ones in the second season of kind of back in that quick like just going at each other back and forth. Um, I think for both of us because we don't have time to rehearse. Like this rehearsal idea is really not something we do on the show um, much. We don't have that much time. Um, so, but I, I think that we've gotten used to that in a way. So like if someone does say the word rehearse, we're like, wait, what? what? Like you're just, you're not going to shoot it? Like, because it's like a seven page, it was like, okay, you're here, seven page scene. It takes a while to get through the scenes because we're not chopping it up. Like we're sitting there every single time every angle we're going from page to page so it's like you almost feel like no don't waste it on a rehearsal like at least hit record <laughs> i think we both want to jump in like that's how we are like let's dive in we'll mess up we'll keep each other going we'll get each other back on track like i i think also you know when we know someone kind of i, I like when I think it was the other day, like Nick even like in the middle of a scene, I, I did, I did it too in one, but it was like, we kind of totally changed the way that we said the line. So it was like, oh, like we've been doing it and we were kind of, we know the scene and then he just played it in a new way. And you're like, oh, okay. Like, and it was like genuine surprise. Like I think finding those genuine moments where we can shock each other, that's what's gonna, it always normally, like that's what appears on screen um, or the moments we break. 
and we laughed. We're like, that was like, that was good. <laughs> Like, hold it together. All right, good. They can cut back to me. They can use that take. That was- <laughs> you know, like we're like afterwards, we're like yeah, that that was the one. That was the one. Um, but yeah, I think finding just like new ways to interpret or like a new cadence to the way a word is said. That we're like, wow, that was like that was good. That was interesting. Like we're we're very encouraging <laughs> to each other. I think. Um, and yeah, just like to get into it. We're just like, all right, we just got to do it. Yeah, we're not too precious and with it. And I don't think you can be. We're kind of happy to make fools of ourselves and try things. And like you say, I think supportive and, and enjoy like playing off of each other. So that makes it very easy. It's like, yeah, when El does something funny, I'm like, oh, that was really funny. And I'm like, oh, don't laugh. Sometimes I'll laugh. I'm like, just get to the end of the take so it's it's good and then carry on. And it's like, yeah, just I think I think with all with all the cast, I think everyone's re- really enjoys it because the scenes are good. So it gives you great confidence to like just go in and have fun and enjoy doing them. And that means that I think, I think that's something that people sense kind of watching the show sometimes that people, that we're having fun doing it, you know. I think you can sense that in people's work, even if even if it's not a scene that's like a fun scene per se. It's like you can still see that they're enjoying it somehow, or I don't know, makes it more watchable. Yeah. And and Nick, I wanted to talk a little bit about the the huzzah of the show because if there's one word that everybody has taken away from the show, it is the huzzah. Um, and I thought it was so interesting that that the way that you use it in so many different forms and and to mean so many different things. And and we're mentioning how part of the genesis of that came from working on the favorite, one of the exercises that you did, being at the end of lines to say what what and to really think about all the different ways that you could add that into a line. And and so I wanted to ask how that really informed the way that you pulled huzzah into so many moments to the point where you found yourself even using it if it wasn't in the script at certain moments yeah I think those exercises did be, were very useful because you because you because you have to always tag on a word at the end of a sentence or something in those games it means you get used to and so hazard can mean anything and just kind of is a little bit of a a, a cherry on top or a, an exclamation mark or whatever it might be um and then it's just yeah, just after you said it so many times, it becomes quite a natural thing to just <laughs> um, to say. I think, yeah, I think the first series I had to be wary of like getting to the end of a scene and then just saying hazard because you run out of dialogue to say and they haven't called cut yet. So you just just say hazard if in doubt. I don't think I've, I don't feel as though I've said we've said it as much, or I've said it. I don't feel as though I've said it as much so far in season two. Maybe maybe I'm imagining that. I'll have to do a hazard count on the scripts. Yeah. Can, we, can we get a hazard count? <laughs> and Tony, one of the other language things that I wanted to ask you about is is the use of curse words because you use them with such brilliance again in so many different ways. You know, it can really be used to break someone down viscerally, or it can be used in a really comedic and, and fun way. I have to admit that my favorite phrase that you've written into the show is cunt struck for some reason, because it's just so offensive but delivered in such a comedic way. Um, you know, again, kind of like do you do you find yourself thinking consciously about the way that you really want to bring that type of language into the script, or is it similar to the myriad of modern and classic language? language where it's just very second nature to you at this point um yeah it's pretty second nature I mean I we do we don't rehearse we do have a read through so I do sometimes we'll see if we've just got some because I'm lazy and it's just crept in um yeah they're, they're supposed to be used really like tonally like emotionally um rather than just peppered through the script I do try and use them because I'm a bit of a language nut so everything is used very specifically um, because that's the because otherwise if the language is too loose it doesn't work or if it's there's too much swearing if, you know sometimes scripts come in and there's a lot of swearing and it's like no it's got to be really really specific how we do it and why we do it so yeah it's 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 um it's fun but uh, yeah my mom my mother hates it but other than that most people like it. I think on at the I end also- of series one there was a scene where. We- we were looking for a new line of dialogue, I think for George and, and we and we text you off set being like, hey, what, what could be this line here? And within like 30 seconds, Tony had text back this brilliant line that had the word cocknotized in it, <laughs> which I'd never, I'd never heard that expression or that word. I don't even know if it is, but it was like so, so genius and also so quick that you responded with it. It's never been in one of the scripts before. And we're all like, ah, oh, genius. That's what we need, cognitized. 
a little example of how naturally it comes to Tony. <laughs> Tony, I also really love the way that you use mirror languaging as a tool between these two characters and the game that they're playing up against each other. You know, in that later scene in episode 10, where he's found out about her betrayal to him, you know, he kind of mirrors back. I love that you see that when he's gained the upper hand, but then you also use it for Catherine as a tactic of ingratiating herself into him. You know, even going back to the fact that she starts using the word Hazar herself and really is kind of mimicking him a little bit to get him on her side. And, and so I really wanted to ask a little bit about how you use language mirroring throughout the scripts in so many different ways. Yeah, I mean, I use it, um, I don't, it's not too conscious. It's just something that started happening. And I think it's because the characters are very engaged with each other. And, you know, Nick and Alice, so in, like those those two handers are like our, you know, for me, they're like just such the, my favourite thing to go watch and on set, you know, because I think there's such engagement, there's such listening. So I'm always like they really listen to each other. And so I am I just feel like they, they have a rhythm and it locks them together in a way as characters. And so they listen and they feed back and they take every opportunity like you, like they do as actors. It's like they take every opportunity to like, take the other one down or challenge the other one or like, you know, one up. And so I feel like they're always in this slight, their dialogue is competitive and it is kind of, so it is mirroring is a good way to like get your opponent in that I listened and I've now you're used your card against you is a kind of like fun thing for, it's fun to write and fun to play, I guess. And um, yeah, so I just like, I mean, I really love those kind of things in language, you know. Yeah. And then Elle and Nick, I wanted to talk a little bit about your work on, on the show with the Intimacy Coordinator. And Elle, I know that that's the first time that you've ever worked with one before. And Nick, I'm not sure if you've worked with an Intimacy Coordinator before, if this was your first project. But how having someone on set who can really focus just on a lot of the logistics and technicalities of those scenes allows you to keep your focus and have more of a central focus just on the character moments within those scenes and the emotional side of things and having to think a little bit less about the technicality yeah, it's good. It's good in that sense, in terms of breaking down technicality and kind of making it um, very much kind of a choreography that can be broken down very clearly for everyone. But um, there's also a nice thing that having the intimacy coordinators there, they kind of they do actually help with the character beats of it as well in some ways, because then you've got almost like yeah, someone who 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 you can say, well, I don't think my character would do this, and they can suggest something like this. Yeah. Don't forget about that. And you go, oh yeah, that's a great thing because this character would feel like this about it or do that in response to it so i it's a very handy thing on top of obviously the the good elements in terms of making sure everyone's comfortable and happy with what they're doing yeah yeah is that the same for you al yeah i think it's the same I mean, yeah of course it's like you know makes it safe and it's kind of a liaison to make things like less awkward you know especially like you know with some directors if they feel weird about it or we've had we haven't had that but um but still, they're, uh, yeah, it's nice. I think also just like sh making sure like the anatomy of things looks right. Like sometimes like you would be not there. You'd be like further down, you know, it's just like, you're like, oh, right, right. Yeah. So I, for me, it's like someone who's like looking out for looking out for you, but then also just making sure that it looks real on screen, you know, like someone just in tune to that. So um, yeah, it's been really helpful, I think. And then lastly, I just wanted to ask each of you individually about in working on the show and particularly now that you're in the midst of, of season two, what you feel you've really learned about your craft from, you know, playing these characters, writing and developing these characters and producing the show, maybe starting with you, Nick. With me? Yeah. Oh, no, that's not fair because now everyone else has got <laughs> really great eloquent answers and like really concise and I'll be gibbering away. Um, you know what? I think the thing that's really, really struck home for me is, is just like the, the confidence of having scenes that I'm uh, that I'm really trusting going into acting. That, like I say, that framework of looking at the scene and going, I know this is great on the page, so I can then go in and just have fun with it. And that's been kind of the key thing. I think I've sometimes ended up on in 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 situations where I don't feel that as much, or I'm or I'm not sure what the scene's about exactly, or what I'm bringing to it as a character, and that's. Um, been difficult for me to navigate so this I feel I just feel very happy and enjoy doing it um, and enjoy watching all the rest of the cast and everything so it's, it's just fun. How about for you Elle? Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, for season two, we've like, I feel like I don't know. There's like a a new. There's like a like a new special feeling on set. Like there's something about it. Like I think because we got, which makes sense. Like it's the second season. Everyone's watched the first. People liked it. Like you know, we found the tone. Like we got into our groove. So now there's a real. I can just sense everyone kind of taking more chances. Like in kind of doing even with myself. Like I'm. And I was like going into season two. I was like, oh gosh, like season one, she has such a specific arc where she, you know, from like naive to like powerful. Like you know, it's like all right, that's the traditional arc. I'm like yes. So I'm like, well, she's she's powerful now. You know, I'm like what is she next? Um, but actually, like now getting into it, it's it's so exciting to know. Oh my gosh, there's so much more. Like there's it's just so much beyond that. And I think everyone, we all feel that way with our characters, even with the scripts. Like it's just great. There there's some crazy stuff. So it's I'm really really excited. We're having so much fun. Like we're right in the middle right now. So um, and I don't and Tony writes as he goes along. So I mean we're right. We haven't read um, nine or ten. So we don't know how it ends. Again, we didn't really know how the season one was going to end either. So he keeps us waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, I think yeah, I think season two. Like, I mean, it, it's I mean, COVID's made it harder, but other than that, it's it's fun to come back and do it. Um, and I think for me, it's like one of the reasons I keep everyone waiting for the scripts is because I sort of watch the show. Like, I have four or five before I start. But then I want to watch it and I want to see what happens and I want to see what these guys bring to it. And so I, that, so I think for me, it's like, um, which I haven't really done on a show before. I haven't really, like, I just live for me in a way. Like I have an idea of what I want everything to be. Um, even last year, it was just a fun thing to watch the show and let it evolve and let, let it inform the scripts as you watch scenes play out or characters interact together and you see episodes land and you see, so I, it is like um, that's fun because you do feel like it's a real dialogue between all of us, you know, in terms of oh no actors okay. and you know, okay. it's all that we're making. You know, we're all now knows we're making the same thing, and it is a very specific thing. But it's like we're all on the same road, so it's a kind of you know, it's it's just a sort of good experience to be in second season and watching everyone just deepen everything they're doing, you know. Well, the show is really fantastic. And I think I speak for everybody when I say I can't wait to see what you've been concocting in the second season. And thank you so much to all of you for taking time in the midst of production to talk with us today. Hey, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thanks.